Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is a longtime friend, Ari Weinswag. I'll tell you about Ari in a minute. Those of you who have watched the show know that LinkedIn, uh, know that this show is about grace. We talk about grace under pressure, which is too often dismissed as the soft stuff, you know, the caring, the commitment we show toward one another. And grace for uh, for so many of us, it's the compassion, the, the respect, and the sense of community that we build. And when you do it as a leader, and you will know that Ari is one of those, uh, especially leading in challenging times as we have now, it requires the ability to act for others and energize everyone around you. So welcome, Ari Weinzweig. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. So. It's an honor to be on, John. Thank you. Great. Good to see you. Good. Um, let me tell the folks about you. Uh, Ari Weinzweig is CEO and co-founding partner of Zingerman's Community of Businesses, which include Zingerman's Delicatessen, Bakehouse, Bakery, Creamery, Mail Order, Zing Train, Coffee Company, and I know I'm missing something, Candy, whatever. It's on and on and on. <laughs> Zingerman produces all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's a huge business in Ann Arbor, but it's also a global business of certainly global recognition. Ari himself was recognized as one of the who's who of food and beverage in America uh, by the 2006 James Beard Foundation and award, awarded the Bon Appetit Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Ari is a prolific writer, uh, disgustingly so as uh, someone who's written a lot himself, but Ari's uh, books include Zingerman's Guide to Better Bacon. Oh yeah, so there's all the food stuff. Zingerman's Guide to Great Service, uh, Good Eating, all those kinds of stuff. And the series that he's created, The Anarchist's Guide to All all kinds of things, leadership. And today we're going to talk about his newest book, which is Humility. So um, Ari, welcome to um, Grace Under Pressure. Honor, honored to be on here. And I only feel a modicum of pressure in terms of being on the show. But <laughs> No, pressure's on me. Anyway, Humility. Um, I will tell the folks a story about you. When you opened the, sh the restaurant, the Roadhouse, um, some years ago, is it been 10 years, something like that? Well, you haven't aged a day, but it's been 17. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Long time. Ari used to be uh, made a habit of walking around the tables and being the water boy, pouring tables, which was your way of engaging the customers. But it's an act of humility. So Ari, Ari, what drew you to the topic of humility for your newest book? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, the, the true story is just uh, I got asked to speak at a symposium at the University of Michigan here in town where you and I both are in Ann Arbor uh, about humility. And I, my initial internal response was sort of like, I don't know anything about humility. I wouldn't have a clue what to say. I mean, I, as you said, I've written a lot of stuff. I speak a lot, Zing Train, we teach leadership and all our practices all over the world, but never wrote a thing about humility. We got no internal training class on humility. I obviously have some comprehension of what the word means, but I really couldn't have strung together more than about three sentences without stumbling a lot in between. So uh, the only reason I said yes is that the woman who asked me, Jamie Vanderbrook, uh, had uh, worked for us many years ago, super generous, super nice person, and her husband equally so uh, still works for us as a manager at the deli, Isaac Vanderbrook. And so I didn't have the heart to say no. So I said yes. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and then I had about five, six months or whatever to figure out what I was going to say. And so, you know, I, I'm a history major, Russian history major who studied the anarchists, as you alluded to before. And I just did what history majors know how to do. You start reading and reflecting and trying to figure it out. And, uh, so that's really where it came from. And I, I found like really almost, I'm sure you've had the same experience, any subject that one really dives into studying, it becomes really interesting. The more you learn, the more you want to learn. And so that's what happened to me with humility. And eventually it turned into this pamphlet and I've actually learned more. The pamphlet's only been out a few months, but I've already learned more since. So it's a, uh, it's an ongoing process. Show us a copy of it and just hold it up. I would be happy to see if I can get it onto the screen there. This is the counterintuitive part to make you look humble is that you move the wrong way. But it's a, it's a pamphlet. Uh, we do, I do books and then also pamphlets. So, uh, 
the pamphlets are sort of what social media was back in like 1900. And I used to read a lot of pamphlets from anarchists uh, when I was in school at studying at the Labadee collection. So I have a kind of affinity to them. But back in the old days for a nickel or whatever, you could sell your, put your ideas in print and somebody could buy it and share it with their cousin and keep it going that way. Great. One of the, my jokes and that I tell is that humility is one topic along with vulnerability that they don't teach at business school. So some leaders may be afraid to be humble. What do you tell them? Are you, uh, you and your partner, uh, Paul, Paul Saginaw run a very successful business and have for 38 years. So why, how be humble? Why be humble? So. Well, I, I mean, I guess in a way, it's not for me to tell anybody else what to do. Um, I, 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 in reflecting in hindsight, after doing a couple of years of research on this, it became clear to me that in humility that Paul and I, without even knowing it, were acting in humble ways from the beginning. And I don't obviously say that to take credit for it. It's just reflecting back on like why Jamie asked me to speak at that symposium. And I immediately tried to deflect the invitation, but she kept persisted. And then having now done all this work, I realized that we've kind of come from a humble place all along. Uh, I, 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 having studied it, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear uh, to me that meaningfully effective leadership uh, in any forum, whether it's educational leadership, whether it's in sports, whether it's in business, whether it's in parenting, I mean, it's always going to come from a humble place. Uh, I, I reference a lot of people in, in the books. Uh, Adam Grant uh, wrote a lot about it. We know a uh, U of M graduate whose uh, work is awesome. I recommend it regularly. But he, he said, humility is a hidden ingredient in great teams. Lots of stars means lots of egos, and lots of egos means infighting. To overcome that problem, you need humility. So Jim Collins, everybody will probably on business world in the business world know good to great, et cetera. He has a new book out too. But I mean, he talks about level five leaders. Humility is one of the key uh, components of that. And then Patrick Lencioni, another great uh, business writer, put his book out a few years ago called The Ideal Team Player. And he distilled his studies down to the three characteristics that you could find in all ideal team players, regardless of profession, humble, hungry, which means pursuing greatness, and smart, which doesn't mean intelligence, but more ability to collaborate, social intelligence, emotional intelligence. So it's, it's pretty clear that it's, it's, a, it's an essential ingredient. Well, the challenge is that society sends us in the opposite direction. It does. And what the, the hidden secret behind humility is that when a leader is humble, uh, and I will say that you are, um, it invites people to you um, because you're accessible. You have a comment on that? Awesome. Well, I I think the key is not to try to be humble, but it's to do the right things and be accessible. Being accessible is just part of that. So I'll just say right now, because you're reminding me, my email is ari at zingermans.com. And anybody that wants to reach out is welcome to send follow-up questions. If you know later tonight you can't re figure out what I was talking about, just send a note and we can have a good conversation. But I, I think going back, as you said, to the beginning 38 years ago, I mean, Paul and I both from our own different backgrounds, but we've always believed, A, uh, we had a ton to learn. B, we needed the staff and the customers more than they needed us. Without staff and customers, you're, you're nothing. Uh, I, I think since that point, too, it's become really obvious to me that none, none of us have achieved anything on our own. I mean, this is it's a it's a mythology that is out in the world at large, especially in our culture here in the U.S., that people, you know, the great hero who made it happen. But the reality is like your mother taught you how to tie your shoes or you wouldn't have gotten to school. Somebody taught you how to read. I mean, these are all, you know, somebody drove the school bus. I mean, so it's it's these are all people who have contributed quietly, uh, often forgotten, but have contributed to what we do. So I, I think accessibility is part of that because my belief is I'm going to learn as much from the person to whom I'm being accessible as they're going to learn from me. And, and then also, I, as you know, I mean, I wrote a whole book about beliefs and uh, there's an essay in there about time management. And I realized like I just have this sort of belief like there's I mean, I, obviously, there's extremes. You can cross the border line into something that doesn't exist. But there's, there's, there's always time. 
and and I find it's uh, it's quite remarkable, but awesome, interesting conversations come from being accessible, and whether that's pouring water or sharing my email on stage, as I have done thousands of times, uh, it's amazing how many cool ideas come from that, connections, learning opportunities, et cetera. Well, that's, see, that's an operative principle behind humility because an arrogant person doesn't invite people to him or her, whereas a humble person, that's an open door. Um, you have a quote in there about from Mozart that said, the music is not in the notes, it's in the silence between. Mm -hmm. What's the connection between that quote, which Miles Davis also appropriated? <laughs> yep. um, what's the connection to humility? So, well, it just struck me when I was. I mean, part of the, the humility and the accessibility is it's it's being accessible to people, but it's also accessibility to ideas and accessibility to other walks of intellectual life. Uh, and so part of my belief, and I'm sure you share it, is that we can learn from every walk of life, right? And so uh, I'm, I'm writing a lot now about ecosystem as a metaphor for organizations. Uh, I, I got going on it because I was reading about permaculture, right, which in theory is not a business practice, but it actually is a business practice. So Studying music for me, I, I wrote a pamphlet uh, a couple of years ago called The Art of Business, which is about my belief that business and life are like art or music or whatever. So I, I have a high affinity for, for studying those areas. And when I saw that quote uh, from him, and as you said, other musicians say much the same thing, it, it resonated because humility, like the, the humble leader in the meeting is not dominating the conversation. The humble leader is not dominating the headlines. The humble leader is pushing the staff or their coworkers or their colleagues out front to, to take some of the spotlight. And it doesn't mean that we disappear or we abdicate our responsibility because we need to be present and we have a deep responsibility. You, you coach leaders all over the world. I mean, it's, it's important, but it's, a, it's also important to have them be present and get attention. And so I, I realized that humility was like the quiet silence between the notes. Like you, it's, it's not in the press release. Uh, it doesn't even show up in the notes from the meeting, literally, but where it does show up is the energetic support and presence uh, that the other people feel. And so as their level of excellence, as their wisdom, as their leadership skills rise, then I'm rising with them, but from behind the scenes. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that. Um, I took a shot at business schools and humility, but I have to take it back because there's a person that we know in common and whose work you cite in the book. And that's uh, Wayne Baker, yeah. whose yep. newest book is Ask for Help. Yep. So what lessons have you learned from Wayne? So. Well, I've learned I've learned that you can apply a lot of creative stuff in business school uh, because he does it all the time. Yeah. Um, his that book is right on in terms of its its uh, correlation with the work around humility. I mean, he he. I, I'm more of an intuitive, so I just go. That seems like a good idea. It makes sense, and I ask five people that I respect, and I'm like, "That's it. It works." Yeah. You know, he's he's much more in the social science world, like Adam Grant. So they actually do research, and and compile statistics, which almost always correlate with what we were thinking intuitively but it's still good to have that data and he uh in there he shows quite clearly uh what I, I just think makes sense i mean which is that when you most of us have been socially trained to have the belief that leaders should not ask for help uh, we've been trained to have the belief that leaders asking for help is a sign of weakness that will undercut our credibility and yet he shows quite clearly that despite that, when we do ask for help, A, we get it, and then B, is that we, we actually raise our credibility level because people acknowledge the humanity that we're owning up to, and people feel honored that they're important to us, and that the other method, which is to act like we're the greatest thing in the universe and we don't need anybody, actually leaves people feeling disenchanted and disengaged. You have some interesting points in the book that, and I'm, I'll let's run through them, but and play the role that uh, let's uh, let's discuss the role that humility plays in each. You said be more responsible, uh, take ownership. What's the connection to humility there? So, well, I, I think uh, this was actually just evidenced on on the, in the news. I don't know a couple of weeks ago there was. Uh, 
minor, relatively minor miscue in estimating the uh, uh, volume of vaccine vaccinations that would be going out to the various healthcare centers. And I think it's General Perna, if I remember correctly, who's running that program. And without getting into politics, we haven't had a plethora of people taking responsibility for situations lately. Right. But he just said, it's my fault. He didn't, and I, you know, look, he, he didn't give somebody an order to say, don't distribute this properly. He didn't tell somebody, let's try to miscalculate on our forecast. And I, I'm sure if you really sat him down and you knew him well and you had coffee, he'd tell you who it was somewhere that didn't do something right. But rather than pointing fingers, which I, I, I always, you know, instinctively, that's, I, I'm like every other eight-year-old, like, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> It's a it's a it's an auto response, but it's it's very unhelpful. And so, taking a deep breath and doing what he did, which is to just say, "I'm responsible. I apologize. We're going to do better." Was simple, direct, and and to the point. And the people involved feel supported and 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 recognized. And I think we've touched on this, but it's a good point. So it doesn't hurt to reiterate it. Um, the role the humility plays in acknowledging shortcomings and asking for help. Yeah, so this is, I mean, back to Wayne's book for sure, but I I quoted uh, the writer Dove Seidman in here, I mean, who wrote a piece in op-ed in the time, New York Times, I don't know, during the pandemic, and uh, he said what is true. He said, like, people want their leaders to acknowledge when they don't have the answer, and if all you say is, I don't know, then what's the point of being there, of course, but to never not know is absurd because none of us... I mean, I know like this much of what I need to know in the world, right? And 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 he referenced Dr. Fauci, who, you know, he said part of why people like and respect Dr. Fauci is because sometimes he says he doesn't know the answer and it becomes it's real. Yeah. And I since I read that and I well, while I was working on this, I've actually started to sort of mentally take note when I hear interviews from people and to see how many times they say they don't know because I I mean, every day I'm learning something that I don't that I didn't know. Every week there's problems coming up that I never even imagined would come up. And so I, I think being real about that is really helpful. And I realized in hindsight, like we've been teaching people in our service training here because the reality of the way we do service is customers are always going to ask for stuff that we don't know the answer to. I mean, and you know, you've been coming here probably since we opened, right? And so the reality is somebody who I'm um, sitting across from Zingerman's coffee company. The reality is somebody who's worked there for six weeks. Like, you know, more about Zingerman's than they do. I mean, I don't care how much training we do. Like you have 38 years of on the ground cultural knowledge about where this is at the deli or something. And so it wouldn't be that weird for you to ask the person at the coffee company a question to which you're actually eminently more qualified to know the answer than they are. But if they feel this social pressure that they're supposed to know the answer, it's not unlikely scenario. They'll start making up answers. And when we do that, we get ourselves in trouble. So we have tried uh, never perfectly, but to teach people in the service training, you just say, wow, that's a great question. Can, can you hold on for just a moment? Let me try to get you an answer. Or can I call you tomorrow or email you later today or whatever it's going to be? But just let's just own it and build that into the culture that there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Yeah, that's great. And our next point is something that uh, resonates with me because I've talked about it in grace. And I know you exemplify it throughout the 38 year history of Zingerman's. It's just so evident when and you walk into any establishment and that's treat others with dignity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote a whole piece on it that uh, we can put the link in the show notes, but it was back in, I think, end of August or early September about dignity. And I, I realize, you know, with all of the conflict nationally and, and, and the tensions that have been, they're not new, but have been brought to the surface at new heights this year, uh, there's been a lot of talk about return to civility. But I realize like civility is better than antipathy, but it's still sort of like there's a ceasefire, but we're not really, we don't really love each other. I just wrote about love for the e-news that'll be out tomorrow, love in the workplace. But but I realize dignity is far deeper and far more meaningful. And and dignity for, I really like humility. I hadn't really thought about it. I mean, clearly I like the idea of it, but I couldn't have really put together much uh, in-depth thought on it. So I started studying and I realized that it really is about 
treating everybody as if they are a meaningful, important human being, which fits with the beliefs Paul and I have had since we opened the deli. Absolutely. But so it's, it's again, sort of an unconscious uh, act, act for us. It's not like we said, let's treat everyone with dignity. Okay, good idea. Let's start tomorrow. It's just the way we were raised or what we believed. We had other problems from our childhoods, but that was an <laughs> upside. And and so it's really just, it goes with my anarchist beliefs. It goes with all the stuff we do. I mean, it's just, I have, this is not an exaggeration. It's not a figure of speech. It's not something I'm making up to say on a, on a podcast, on a LinkedIn live show. It's, it's, I really believe that everybody has something intelligent to offer and that no joke, I can learn from everybody. And, and the whole thing of getting out of hierarchical thinking, which socially we've been again, trained to do so uh, unconsciously, it's so problematic because it makes us think like, Hey, I'm the CEO. I'm better than the new dishwasher. When in fact, I'm not, I'm not any better. I'm different. I know stuff they don't know, but they know stuff I don't know too. Yeah. It's a good point, and it dovetails into this last point I want to touch on, and this is where humility really plays the game, especially for when we um, tend to be a little full of ourselves, and that's humility helps us to be open to views different from our own. Yeah, well, this is, uh, yes, I mean, in, in a sense, it's it's straightforward, but I you know, I like to be right, just like the next person, maybe even more than the next person. I don't know. But I, I, I have been wrong many times. I've probably been wrong five times today that I don't even know about yet. <laughs> um, and, and then just learning that although I'm a big believer in the value of the individual and in the uniqueness of every human being, I mean, there's nobody like you in the whole planet, literally. Uh, and, and so that's critical. And I, I have studied and written about creativity to learn about that too. And it's clear, like, I mean, the idea comes from the individual, but the wisdom of the group can enhance the, the idea of the individual. And so all of our thoughts can be elaborated on and made better when we're around good people right. and everybody's got a good idea. And I just would suggest most organizations, as you already know, and teach your clients, I mean, that most organizations are missing out on 95% of the intellectual capital that they're paying for because they're not having conversations with people on the front lines. They're sitting in a small circle of upper level people who, with all due respect to those of us who are in that smaller circle, we still don't know what it's like to really be on the front line. And and so having those conversations, not as a trick to engage people, because this is commonly how I get asked about it. Like, I want people to feel more engaged. And I'm like, why don't you just engage them? <laughs> <laughs> just it's, engage. It's, it's not a trick. Like, just yeah. sit down and ask. And I, I you know, I, I've come to say, like, just, okay, like, do you have conversations with your business partner or the upper level leadership team? Well, yeah, of course. So, well, here you go take exactly the same questions and go ask the new delivery driver the same questions. Because although they might be scared for the first 90 seconds, they have the same kind of thoughts that you and I do. And I don't know what I'm doing and they don't know either, but we have a chance, A, at the least they're gonna be treated with dignity, back to your earlier point. B, they start to realize their thoughts matter in the organization. And C, it's highly likely they actually have some good insight that I wouldn't have thought of. Well, absolutely. And that's where um, it, it, that's why when we talk about engagement, it, it, you know, it's I always call it a fancy word for do you like to come to work? And one of the reasons you want to come to work is because you feel that you belong, which is yeah. our values. That's where to me, that's where grace comes involved. Grace is our how. So when I look at your work and the in the body of work that you've done in leadership. It's not just that you write about leadership as lots of us do. You live it because it's inherent in your businesses. And when someone goes into a Zingerman's establishment, there's a feel. It's tangible. Mm -hmm. um, people are welcoming. And I know how much work that takes. And it comes down to treating people with respect. Sounds like a cliche, but it's not. So... Yeah, no, I, I, when I was writing the dignity piece, it dawned on me that uh, clearly around, we're doing a lot of work around diversity inclusion for years, just like many, probably most of your clients. I mean, we all need to be better at that. And it's, it's a long, long project that we're only partway into and I need to do better. Everybody here needs to do better. I started to realize though, as I was doing that work, like I, if you're treated with dignity, 
then you are more likely that's basically getting at what those measures are because as a shy introvert i barely feel included and i started the company <laughs> now intellectually i know that i am included intellectually i know that i have enormous power in quotes but the my my emotional state is still sort of like a 12 year old inside me and so I'm nervous just going to work every day and people don't believe it, but it's, it's not like I need to get myself grounded, take a deep breath and show up at work. And, and so if that's how I feel and I started the business and I've been doing all this stuff and I've spoken to thousands of people from the stage and I still feel that way. Imagine what it's like to be 17 on your third week at the roadhouse bus and tables or whatever. So I think, absolutely treating people with dignity and respect, having meaningful conversations with them, being eager to learn from them all of those things create the kind of engagement that people have been taught to try to do but i think in many ways uh, michelle seeger you know her uh, in town you know who wrote uh, her book no sweat and she talks a lot about what she calls the wrong why which is when people don't stick with programs like mm -hmm. exercise or whatever that it's usually because they have the wrong why which is what our friend vic strecker would say is they don't have the right they don't have purpose so if you're only talking to people so that they feel more engaged, it comes across as inauthentic, which is the opposite of humility. Right. If um, um, you know, this question is coming because I ask all of my guests um, and there's a double uh, uh, a double hook in this particular one. Tell us a story about grace that has inspired you. And it's got a very relevant uh connection to your business so. yeah i mean i'm sure that you you did ask me and i i mean there's a million of them and i i realize like in some ways like humility like i when when you ask the question it's so simple but then i was sort of stumped and stunned like i don't know but then i realized like connecting your work around grace with the word graceful and the whole idea of approaching business and life like art and treating everybody with dignity, it's really about a way of life, not an externalized act that I can cite, right? So I realize like it's kind of in, in, imperfectly, of course, my whole day. But in particular, in the moment, uh, I just, it made me think about an act of generosity that we're, we've been invited uh, very graciously to participate in, in a way that will help us and help uh, others around the country. So 10 days ago, uh, I got a call from Marcus Limonis, uh, who I honestly don't know, but when I looked him up, is quite well known around the country. I don't watch TV, but he has a show and I, uh, he's connected with a friend, a woman who I have come to know over the years, who's super generous and kind, and that's Maria Shriver. And uh, they, Marcus started a program and they called to ask us to participate in it. It's called Plating Change. And uh, basically he's very generous with the wealth he's accumulated over the years. And he's committed to helping people in the, around the country and in particular people in need. And in particular right now, independent restaurants, you and I were talking uh, before we went on air about the, the challenges of restaurants during the pandemic. It's not like it's the only industry that's negatively impacted, but it's certainly one of the ones that's been hit hardest, along with musicians uh, and performing arts, uh, been hit very, very hard. And so he wanted to be able to help both. And so they came up with a creative program. I mentioned Plating Change. So basically they purchase food from us, in this case in Ann Arbor, in Washtenaw County, and then we will deliver that food at a schedule that works uh, for food gatherers, which is, uh, as you know, the, the local uh, food rescue program here in town, so that people who don't have access and or means to fresh, nutritious food can get it. So it's a, it's a wonderful example. I thought of Grace because they're acting generously. They're helping us to keep people's pay uh, going during the pandemic and help our businesses, but they're doing it in a way that that doesn't just stop there. It actually spreads out into the community and gets to people in need, which there's always people going hungry uh, this time of year. There's even more people historically always going hungry. And then right now in the pandemic with unemployment rates being so high, it's even worse <clears throat> than ever. So it was a very graceful act. And then to take it one step further, they actually have set up a link on Pledgeling, uh, which I had never heard of, but uh, 
which I can send you the link for the show notes, but uh, where they people can donate to this program for food gatherers, which will then take the money, buy more food from us, which we will deliver back to people in need so people around the country can contribute. Well, that is a wonderful story of grace, and uh, your business is a beneficiary of it. And it's only just because you have been so gracious and uh, grateful to so many in our community and around the world through your teachings and your writings and speaking and all of that art. Uh, you exemplify what it means to be humble. And, is, and, and humility is integral to grace. It's been my honor to have you on the show today, and I say thank you. Well, thank you, John. It's an honor to be on with you. And uh, again, my email is ari at zingermans.com, and uh, very happy to converse and learn from people that are on the show, and then all the books that are at zingtrain.com, too. Great. Thank you, Ari. We're going to close out. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, and let's hope uh, we can reconvene on the other side of this crazy year. You bet.